Good afternoon. Murphy, you gotta stop talking. How can you keep talking? I think I, you guys should just come up here. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So I am gonna filibuster for about five minutes because one of the uh, there's supposed to be uh, four old rangers, kind of myself up here. One, one's running a little late. Then why don't you sit on that, that chair right <coughs> there? Put Murphy up there. Well, we might, we might do that. We might do that. <laughs> so good afternoon. Thanks for coming. My name is Scott Van Lair, the director of the Paul Smith's Vic. And this is part of our lecture series. We did this last year as well, too. So this is uh, Old Rangers Tell Old Tales. We don't promise the validity or factual accuracy. Of them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it will be entertaining, um, very unfiltered. So let me start by just recognizing uh, other Old Rangers that are in the audience. So. I will say there's a, a bunch of forest ranger recruits who, in my opinion, are already rangers. Um, since I don't, I only know a couple of you, I'm not actually going to recognize you today. Um, I mean, if I recognized you, I, I would recognize you, but I don't. So let me just start with Gary Lee, who was up on this panel last year. Gary Lee had Moose River Plains from 19... There you go, from 1966 to 1997. 1999, that's right, that's why I wound up in a high piece, because he's in retirement time. <laughs> Let's see who else is here. Tom Glitty, who <coughs> had the unfortunate of being the, he was my roommate in the academy, so our careers overlap. And I was um, very young, I had just turned 23 when we started the academy, and um, was pretty much a disaster, immature, um, real hasty. Tom was, was a bit older, extremely organized. Um, so they put me, uh, they put us together in a room uh, to torment Tom primarily. <laughs> but uh, they would inspect your room every day, and uh, you know, it didn't matter whose side, whose bunk was actually messed up. They would toss the whole room. Uh, it was supposed to be a learning experience. Like Tom would teach me how to make my bed. And so, like, wasn't that their idea? I think Tom. <laughs> anyway, it didn't work. Uh, so every day, poor Tom's, you know, stuck with it. That's right. I made Ken Bruno's bed all the time too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Were you really roommates with Ken too? Yes. Yeah, they they didn't like you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see who else is here. Scott Murphy is here. Where's Scott? Can you, can you raise your hand, please? <laughs> Um, Scott and I uh, were also we were in the same cabin with Tom, and uh, Scott and I worked together a lot um, early on in our careers before he uh, transferred away. But uh, I think Scott and I probably worked together. You and I worked together a lot of incidents, searches, and I certainly learned a lot from Scott. Scott had uh, been in the Marine Corps prior to being a forest ranger, and uh, so I certainly learned a lot from him because I had already. Practice this when I was talking about Tom about how uh, lousy I was to start my career. Is there anybody I'm missing? I apologize. And it's so good to see all um, the new forest rangers here. Just to help me out, can, would you mind just raising your hands? I want to ask you to say your names. Thank you so much for your service and good luck on your career. <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't talk I know at least two of you did. Oh, good. <clears throat> Very good. So, we do have an empty seat. Oh! <laughs> you know me, I can talk. It's so fortunate you live 10 minutes away. <laughs> you so, didn't follow up. Oh, I know. I already told my staff you're going to blame this on me. Uh, have a seat, Julie. You and I, I think we'll just share a microphone. Good. If that's okay. All right, so now. And I did want to recognize uh, one more ranger who was up on this stage last year, who is uh, is not with us uh, now. He passed away this winter. A really good friend of mine. And you go, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can see last year's event. That was Frank Dorchak. And uh, I don't know any. You can say a lot of things about Frank, but I don't think there was a ranger that had more personality than Frank. I mean, he he was a piece of work. And uh, I we do sell his autobiography here. And if you know if you know Frank, it it reads just like uh, he was talking. 
I mean, it, I swear they just recorded him. And uh, Frank, uh, Frank was a good friend of mine. So let me introduce our panel here today. So uh, to my immediate left is Julie Harjo, and Julie was in the class. Scott Wilkie's here. That way, if you can see him, he's waiting for Scott. Here. And Tom Hetty is here. So you have four of us from one academy class. There's only seven of us. So. Uh, Julie started with all of us in 1996, so on the stage you have about 50 years, so essentially as the other two who I'll introduce in a second um, were retiring, we came on, so we all overlapped by a year or two, so you're, uh, you're seeing about 60 years of Ranger Force represented here. So Julie came on in 1996, and um, you know, um, there's a couple of legacies for Julie. Uh, one is the medical work that she did. Um, I think any, any ranger who worked with her, um, uh, her expertise um, for any kind of uh, backcountry medical incident um, and, and the program, the training that she provided us, it really it, it put us like several leaps forward for what we're that. Julie was also the um, fourth female ranger hired and when she came on in 96, it's, it's kind of crazy to think that the only female ranger was Patty Rudge at that time yeah. because now our force is so much closer to being equitable. Um, I gotta say, I don't know if anybody knows this stat, but it's gotta be 30 or 40 percent. But to think about it at a time that, you know, when you came on, it was only Patty Raj. Um, Julie was also the first female ranger to complete a full 25 year career. Somebody, I did forget to ask you to silence your cell phones. It's okay, it's okay. But yeah, if you can silence your cell phones. Um, and then in the middle, actually I'll go to George. Uh, George next. So, uh, farthest away from me is George Steck. George began his career in 1967. Did I get that right? 68. 68. And George's career was in uh, Warren County, Southern Warren County. George. George was really known for being, um, among many things, he was great at fire but he's really known for being super fit. So when I would go to a fire that was in his area, um, at the time he retired 10 years after he retired, uh, he continued to this day 30 years after he retired. He'd be, you remember George Steck? He used to carry three Indian cans. He, he put <laughs> two in each hand, two, you know, four or four on each shoulders. You know, it was, I'm sure it was true, but it was certainly uh, part, of the, part of the legend of, of George Steck and the Forest Ranger, of course. Um, and the middle is who we always call the incredible Bill Houck. Um, Bill Houck, your, your career began in what year? 70. 70, okay. And uh, you retired in 99, also working primarily? 98. That's what I meant, sorry. <laughs> that won't be the first mistake I made. Uh, you worked primarily in Warren County and um, Brant Lake, Rogers Rock area. and. Bill was known for being really an incredible woodsman. Um, for, for those of you from this area who may not be familiar with Bill, uh, and you knew Gary Hodgson, uh, Bill was uh, the comparable uh, skill set, very similar kind of ranger, but in the Southern Adirondacks, and they uh, complemented each other so much. So if I could get a round of applause for my panel today. <laughs> And if you guys um, pick up your microphone when, when it's your time to talk, and we'll, we'll start with Bill. Um, so I'll give you a chance to uh, introduce yourself. Uh, and yeah, why don't we just start with, uh, um, since I introduced you last, why don't you um, introduce yourself and start things off for us. Probably you want the truth. <laughs> I, I'm not really concerned about the truth. Yeah. <laughs> Ten-year-old always wanted to be a forest ranger, and I finally did get there, but it was a long process. Um, 1970, the third time I took the civil service test for the job, I finally made it. They didn't change the questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, is this thing working all right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're doing it. The uh, background of that was I had been in the military and I worked for land surveyors and I did surveying work for 
for the, for the Army also. And I got to give some credit to the first old guy, because you hear, you hear references to the academy. We didn't have academy. Our beginning education in that era, in the 1970s type era, George was in the same category, was the old guys that we worked with. And I got to give the credit to the old World War II, Korean War veteran people that had got this, their forest ranger job. And, and they were our academy. And their experience is, is what, what got us started in the right direction. I would say we, uh, we were well educated with that source being the education. And of course now everything is advanced. We overlapped just a year or two with the first academy that Scott just re referenced to, that Julie was in and two or three others here. But we never were really involved with that, that stage of our, our training was from them old guys, them old Pacific War and European War type people that got their field training was noisy. But it, 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 was, it was good to train them. Uh, and I retired in 98, I did a bunch of other things in between. And that's, and I just told somebody here today, I've been retired long enough now, again, both of us, George and I, that the contest is to live long enough to collect a pension longer than we collected a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> well, while well, you still have the mic in your hand, tell me about the first search you were ever on. Oh, he wants to do... This, this is the setup, see, he's on the phone. <laughs> this, he was on the phone coming up with how he's going to draw all these stories out of people. But the first search, and again, I got a reference to that, uh, World War II veteran uh, stage, because the first search was probably the first or second year that I worked. The boss, who had been in the first mountain troopers, uh, program that was out in Colorado or somewhere, but he'd been to Italy and all that in World War II. And so, I, and then that detail might not be perfect. It might have been he was a Korean War veteran. Don't matter. He got a call. He says, there's two 10, 11 year old boys missing up to Spring Hill Ponds in Hay. Went there. And he says, and I'll go up there, make sure things work all right. He had just started being the boss at the same time I started being ranger. He, and, and, uh, he had been a ranger for quite a few years. And he actually started in, in Lawrenceburg. The background on him is the significance of the question what, that he asked me yesterday on the phone. What's the memorable search? He let me go and do anything I wanted to. <laughs> And all I did was go to where they said them to, it was after dark time we got there. I went a couple miles in the woods, there was this pond that they'd gone to, and, and uh, they were missing somewhere north of Spring Hill Ponds after dark. Two uh, younger than teenagers, I don't know the, the exact age, and two adults. The guy that was with them was the only crew we had. In, in modern thing, a story like that, the dispatcher would make sure, the supervisor would make sure the whole response. <laughs> he's, he's, that, that's not entirely accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but, but bottom line is, either this guy, this is Mike Thompson was his name, either he was trying me out, uh, uh, I don't know exactly the logic of why it was only he and I that responded there. And he stayed with the lady. I went with, with the man, and we went and looked, and I just let the ground tell me where to go. I, I didn't look at my compass, I didn't do any of the things that we were pur purposeful now. I just tried to pretend that I was 10 years old, didn't know nothing, and, and I ended up, after a couple hours, we got a good long ways in the bushes without looking at the compass. And along comes an answer from them people, and we holler your name. Well, and I want 
I tell you, that's the biggest thrill you're going to get out of being a forest ranger. Is holler Pete or Joe half two thirds a night or two days in a row and get an answer. <laughs> but uh, it don't always happen, but it's very satisfying when it does happen. So I says to them, we didn't have uh, the radio system we got now, but it was summer enough that we still had a fire tower observer. I couldn't talk to the boss out on the road, but I could talk to the observer who had been sent up in the tower for, for, because of the search in the middle of the night. And I said, well, we've got a response from these boys. And I told the guy that was with me, I said, you go over. And uh, I didn't want to, you go over toward him, and, and I'll be there in a few minutes. I didn't want to move where I was on the radio because it was touchy radio contact. So we went over there. They weren't hurt, they were lost, they weren't very happy, but they, by daylight, we wandered back, kind of, by then I was allowed to take out my compass. <laughs> and again, I got us back up, to, back up a little bit uphill, towards that Spring Hill Pond. When it all got done, Mike Thompson had the lady cross the pond with a the boat there, and they came over and got us. Nowhere near the same part of the pond we left because I wasn't I was just aiming generally to get back. He shuffled three or four people that wanted time in this little leaky boat, and we got him out onto the road. When it all got done, and this is the this is the, the important part of the story. The uh, we didn't have search training or nothing at that time. Mike says, "Good job, Bill." I says, "And how did you do that?" And I told him about not looking at the compass and just going more or less the easiest way, pretending I was 10 years old. And he says, well, that was a success, but don't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to close on the story. Uh, George, why don't you tell us about the Mohawk Airlines crash? Um, there's been a lot, there's been over 200 plane crashes in the Adirondacks, and the, the deadliest one was uh, Mohawk Airlines crash on Pilot Knob in 69? 69. 69. And uh, that was pretty early in your career. Um, you want to tell us about that one? Yeah, I came on as a ranger in, in 68, and uh, the way these things get started is really unique and unusual, and, and sometimes gratifying. But this was November 69. My son was born in February 69. 8.30 in the evening, a knock comes on the door to the side. It's raining. Knock comes on the door, I open the door. There's three Queensbury High School kids. Mr. Steak, Mr. Steak, we want to tell you about a wolf we saw up on Butler Pond. Come on into the house and explain it to me. They come into the house and my son is in a crib. Opposite the door, sleeping. They're trying to tell me about this wolf they saw. The telephone rings. It's the Warren County Sheriff's Department. George, we think we have a plane crash up on Pilot Knob. It's 8.30 at night. My wife, Elsie, she's at a ceramics class. <laughs> so, so here I have three high school kids want to tell me about a wolf they saw. The sheriff calls and says, we've got a plane crash. And my wife is away to a ceramics class. Need to say, I got with the boys. I called a woman, a friend of ours, and she came up to babysit until my wife could come home. So I get in the truck and I head up towards uh, Pilot Knob Road. It's in Queensbury. And uh, Nance Kilmeyer, a forest ranger from Fort Ann, and Jim Delaire, a forest ranger from Argyle. Both of those guys are Washington County. And a uh, state trooper, Kubricki, uh, the old three headed down on the floor, up the mountain. And it's raining. The rain changed the snow. And they had their lights, but they couldn't see to the top of the ridge. So we had Frank Wheeler, a forest ranger from Warrensburg, go to Prospect Mountain Fire Tower and look across. And he was guiding them by their flashlights <coughs> towards the thing. He could see the plane, where the plane was. And he directed those three men to the wreck. Once they got up there, it was obvious to, to the three of them there were no survivors. The plane, it, it crashed into the, like a, a corner. Everything was jumbled in one pile. It wasn't scattered over the mountainside. 
So it was quick to turn the fire and, and the uh, condensed wreckage that no one survived. I was down on the Platon Knob Road and people were coming by trying to help. And, and of course, with the radio, every transmission that came across, they were listening to. Uh, so, and fortunate, fortunate or unfortunate, they just so happened about 100 feet away from this wreck, there was a cabin with a wood stove in it. And the three of them, they reeled down, no survivors. They went into that cabin. It was owned by a man named Jekyll. He had a, a car dealership in Queensbury, and he eventually moved out to Colorado. But it was his cabin, 100 feet away from the wreck, dry, had the wood stove, got comfortable. And the next morning, we had a lot of help come in. We had a, uh, it, it turned to snow that night. We had about six, seven inches of snow. So then the bombardier, or bombardier in the snowmobile came in, and uh, we found the 14 people. Uh, they were badly burned. So we put them in the, in the bags, and we trucked them out over the backside, because that was the easiest side to come in. When Kilmeyer and those three guys left the site, the path they took out, over to the east side of the mountain was the most direct route to come and go to that wreck. And uh, sad to say, like I said, uh, nobody survived. And now there is a, a monument there. Uh, somebody took this granite crucifix and must weigh a couple hundred pounds. And to hold that up there, something, there's a name on it, there were some French uh, passengers on that plane. And fortunate enough, when that plane came up, it was from the Guardian in New York, it stopped that opening and a bunch of people got off. And there were some people down in the Guardian who canceled that flight. But their destiny was their time and a lot of people got off in the opening and they blamed it on the weather. Uh, he made an attempt to land at the Warren County Airport which wasn't successful so he made another pass and they say the path they chose under conditions was snowing rain and snow, and that he missed the top of the mountain, just a couple hundred feet, is that close. So that's one of the things that we always had to deal with during our career was fatalities, and um, you know, we um, always want to be respectful of the families, and of course we're you know, compassionate people, and, and dealt with that a lot during our careers, dealing with the families, uh, the lost loved ones. Um, you know, we'll try and reflect that it's on the stage here as well too, but it does, you know, it played a role in our, our career. Um, real quick, George, another, I won't say who it was, but a, a different old ranger who was on that incident, you may or may not name, uh, had told me about the state police being posted up there as well too, having to keep track of, you know, because it, it was a, um, you know, it was a, not a crime scene, but a crash scene, right? So you had to wait for, um, NTSB or whatever it was at that time to come up. So there were troopers there and there were rangers there and the troopers had it all dialed in where they would get relieved every few hours and you were basically left up there for... The, the rangers eventually, there's a bunch of us, maybe six, eight, ten rangers, and uh, we, from the time we got there, we stayed there night and day while when the state police came in, and no, no disrespect, <laughs> shit was up. They calculated the time to get from that wreck down to the car and go home. <laughs> and, and here, they, this cabin was there, we got the wood stove going, but that was that line that we stayed there night and day, some of us, for hours into the night and the next morning, and they changed their eight hour shift. <laughs> and at that time, we didn't get paid overtime. <laughs> they were on the clock. <laughs> well, I have respect, like I say, you know, uh, Trooper Kubricki, he was with Kilmer and Delaire when, uh, when they first went up, so I'll give him credit. <laughs> <laughs> it was Luke Kurth who uh, told me about that. I don't think it was, you, know, you verified it. Um, so I'll just, we'll go to Julie now, and I'll stay on the theme of plane crashes just, just for the last, well, at least the one, last one I've been playing here. Um, this was fairly earlier in our career. Oh yeah, you can borrow that one. That, work, that works well. <laughs> I tried to have three microphones, but you know how it is with older equipment. Uh, at least the four trainers do. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, early in our time up here, there, we had a plane crash here in 2004 near, near the airport here. You want to uh, tell us that story, please? Yeah, it's kind of a brief story, but um, April 2nd, 2004, sorry, I use notes. Um, uh, kind of my first plane crash that I had ever worked, and it was, I live very close to here. It's, I should have gotten here a little earlier, but uh, the Lake Clear Airport is... And that wasn't my fault, by the way. No. <laughs> we'll discuss that later. <laughs> um, so 2004, and it was, uh, you know, call came in for a possible downed aircraft, and there was, it's a fairly small airport, so there's a lot of planes coming in and out of there, and after I kind of wrote this down, I was thinking, well, I've actually been on like three at that airport, I think, so there's been a few of them, but this was a single-engine Piper, <laughs> that was last heard about 7.30, and the weather was kind of like it is in the Adirondacks, kind of crappy, and they uh, were coming in and uh, basically just lost track and just plowed into the trees and then crashed. So that was a, a two-person fatality, but it was the first time I'd ever worked with a civil air patrol, which was really interesting because they're all volunteers, and essentially that's their job is to come to a scene and try and work with um, their telemetry stuff to try and locate the emergency locator beacons, the black box. Um, so they were able to, to kind of narrow it down for a few miles and we started doing a search there. And then we finally were successful when the state police put their helicopter up and then just kind of followed the track to where that, that plane would have been would have been coming in. And it was right, right on track, but about two miles short of the airport. So um, we ended up doing the, the extrication on that as well. Um, so yeah. What I remember on that one is how soupy it was. I, I, don't, I wasn't involved with it as long as you were, but I remember the day it was found and being in the woods there, and it was fine. Like, yeah, I, really, really yeah it, it was super heavy uh, ground cover fog that day. Um, and I do remember. It's funny when you know I ask people, you know, what do you want to talk about? What story you want to talk about? And I totally forgotten. You know, we've been on so many incidents, sometimes uh, you forget about them. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds. And that's one I totally forgot. That was kind of interesting too. In that um, I chronicle some of the plane crashes in the Adirondacks, and most of the the planes from the last 20 years get removed. The insurance companies tend to move, or the ones from uh, the older guys era. They uh, those those planes tended to remain uh, or pieces of them. But that that one's different. That it's still there. Um, it is still there. Really? Unless I got the wrong plane, but we'll. we'll <coughs> Well, I said truth is I said the truth is is not that important. So. Um, George, let me go back to you. Um, Julie and I were on a search a few years ago, and, and several others were out here on, on White Face Mountain. For uh, it was very unusual because a skier went missing there, and they have a ski patrol there that tends to find her. They actually come down the mountain every day, check the trails. And by the way, if anybody thinks that with these register boxes all through the forest preserve, <laughs> that um, one, we're walking the trail at the end of the night, or even checking the register box to make sure everybody sends out, no, <laughs> that doesn't happen. But a white face, they actually ski down. And uh, that one lasted a long time for us and eventually had a, a, an unusual ending. And um, as we were talking, you had a kind of a similar one in 1971, Richard Giles. Can you tell us about that one? Richard Giles. I'm going to make an analogy here. Richard Giles, the search was five days. And on the other hand, I had another search for a 24-year-old disabled kid named Mazda. And he was in the Wilson Developmental Center down in, uh, in uh, Saratoga County. We got the call, it was a Sunday for Giles, it was hunting season. He went hunting on French Mountain, and he didn't return. And his wife called, it was Sunday night, I went out, and we had snow on the ground. So, so we went in, some local volunteer firemen, and we searched, and we couldn't find him, uh, any sign of him. We followed his tracks of snow, he moved around while hunting, he came back out towards the road, and that was the end of it. In the meantime, the family's there. The next day, Monday, we had other rangers come down. We had volunteer fire company. He worked for General Electric in Hudson Falls. They sent up 200 employees to help look for uh, their, this guy. 
And uh, had the helicopter come up flying. We knew on that first day he was not there. But until we found something better, we had a wait. Five days later, we get a call from Tampa, Florida. <laughs> He's down in Tampa, Florida. He hitched up, took a bus down in Tampa, Florida. And between him and the minister of the church, they were saying, who was going to call home to tell, tell his wife where he was? <laughs> Five days and we beat the bushes. <laughs> now, on the other hand, this other five-day search, this, this kid who could already talk, and he was uh, mentally retired, and that was on a Sunday. And we went looking for him, and we did what we call a type three, type three search, and we searched the area night and day. Couldn't find him. And there's a creek that runs through, and the canoe, people went down in canoes, and, and, and the hunters saying he couldn't speak, he wouldn't answer audibly. So on the fifth, fifth day, I was being the bushes between the, the creek. And where I was, about 50 feet, it was so thick. It was so thick, though, you wouldn't be able to be there. And all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I saw what looked up here to be a brown paper bag. And I said, how the hell did that brown bag get in here? And in my mind, I thought, hey. the night before we found him, I found him, I got a telephone call that one of my brother-in-law's was killed in an automobile accident that same uh, the day before. But when I look at five days in Tampa, Florida, <laughs> when I look at five days with this kid, and he stayed there, the way he was matted down, and the feces, and his, he's naked, and just in a fetal position. And when I compare those two, and nothing happened to the guy in Florida. No, nothing happened. A couple things on, uh, from that. Um, yeah, go ahead, Gary. I, I just read. Related to that search of the child, uh, Don Perryman and I, it snowed more than you said, George. It was feet of snow. Yeah. And we climbed up uh, the south side of that mountain. It seemed to me it was Thanksgiving Day. It may have been a Sunday morning or something. And Don and I got to the top of that mountain and then we found out that the guy was in Florida. It's always hard to have fact checkers in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> George, <laughs> I made the analogy or uh, comparison from uh, of the white face surgeon. Probably many of you remember that when we searched. Do you remember how long? I don't think I was on that one. Sorry. You were the only one. Then. Yeah, I was the only were, one that one. Were you a lieutenant already by then? Oh, that explains it. Um, yeah, that one, uh, the white face search, I, I, I honestly can't remember how long it went on for. It was at least five days. At least five days, yeah. but suddenly we got a phone call. Um, how many times? Yeah, at least yeah. a week. I was on it the first night, and there was a lot of snow. Uh, there was a lot of new snow, but all the patrollers we talked to was like, "This has never happened before." We're like, so we kept, you know, we're thinking somebody hit a, tree, you know, he hit a tree and got buried by the snow. And uh, a week later, he called his wife, and he was in Sacramento, California. <laughs> and it's never been fully explained how he got there. He uh, said he hit his head. Uh, got a haircut along the way. He got a ride from a tractor trailer operator in his ski boots. Uh, yeah, so he had his ski boots in Sacramento. Um, so that was too much. And then type three search that George mentioned, that's that's a grid search we do. So that's where you get a, a block of land, if you will, and you uh, have a, a searcher to your right or left, and you cover everything, everything between you and the person to your to your right or left. Um, it's a very, uh, it takes a lot of time to complete that, so we don't need to get into that um, uh, right away. Um, let me go back to Bill. Bill, you know, um, the High Peaks always got a lot of attention, especially recently uh, you know, with all the incidents there, but you know, you have a, you had an incredible landscape there, particularly with Rogers Rock, and you must have had uh, many incidents there. Um, if you can tell us about working Rogers Rock and maybe put an incident or two there, please. There's a little bit of um, 
background to Rogers Rock. It's in the town of Hague. When I got the state job in Grand Lake, there was a forest ranger in Hague. Uh, Clyde Black was a, was a ranger, and then two or three years later, it's about 73, 4, 5, something like that. He had a chance to lateral transfer and go to Tupper Lake, and he did. They said, Bill, you uh, watch over Hague until we get somebody who and they never did. <laughs> so, so I ended up with those two that included on the far edge, the Lake George shoreline edge of Hague. Is Rogers Rock campsite, which is a little bit south on the shore of Rogers Slide, the historic story about the about uh, walking backwards over the cliff and all that revolutionary uh, uh, history. But anyhow, it attracts quite a lot of people along the same line of interest of people as your big free climbing and rope assisted climbing. Uh, fad that hit in, in the 70s, more or less. Uh, Melner, what's his first name? Uh, Jim, no, uh, Jim Wagner and, and Melner wrote the book. Don't matter, that era of time brought a, a lot of interest in, in climbing cliffs, which brought a lot of, especially the high peaks people where there was a lot of cliffs, and that's a big part of their, their rescue work. Down there, on Rogers Rock, when those people wore themselves all up here, they wanted to do something new and different. They started a fad in two or three places down there. And it was intense for quite a few years, during the, the, the 80s and 90s. And so that's, that's the background I referred to. In doing that, being the forest ranger for that, and training and assembling equipment, inventing programs. We first hired Jim Wagner to give the rangers who had the high peaks climbing problems, and I was up there with them, uh, largely because of Rogers Rock, a good share of the same things that happened here in magnitude is the word, in, in tens and hundreds, happened on Rogers Rock in twos and threes. Uh, had one fatality uh, and a whole bunch of stranded people. It was kind of like lost people that come out early in the morning of the next day because if they, they just got monkeyed up a half hour before dark. And if they had another couple hours of daylight, they would have made it. Well, the people on Rogers Rock a good share of them could have probably traced themselves back to the, the way they were climbing, let them free climbing, and, and got down off the rock or off the side of it somehow and got down. But they would freeze, they would be up there, and a good share of them were just assisting people. Uh, we only had one that was a fatality, and it was a free climbing. But the bottom line, it brought me, a forest ranger, outside of the intense uh, geography that caused that fad here. It, it brought me into it, and I was halfway interested in it anyhow. I was the kid with the, with the tree house and the, and the ropes and the jungle gym, and I should have had a long tail, you know. So <laughs> but the bottom line is, that became my interest, and Secondary effect was that it connected with the guys up here that had it. Not they didn't have a choice. They, they had they had the demand <laughs> to, to, to draw it, to draw it in up here. That specialized training for that, as I just said, came from the, the, the original proprietor of the Mountaineer down here in Keene. He, he uh, was good at it. He sold the equipment. He was good at it. The search and rescue team, Gary Lee right there, was on the search and rescue team. That was an <coughs> era of time that brought uh, four or five rangers out of each piece of geography, one, one six or eight I guess, out of western 
Adirondacks and Eastern Adirondacks and Catskills. It was three teams. That was used as a response for those kind of specialty things, and so we got that specialty training, starting with Tim Wagner, and then we got some other specialty training, and then we got to the point where that whole program turned into training that is now part of the academy that this generation deals with. That was the background that started that. But anyhow, Rogers Rock gave me the opportunity to be involved with that, even though I wasn't in the High Peaks area. So Bill referenced the search teams. So those search teams, they started after Doug Leg? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So it's something that didn't last particularly long, but um, you know, rangers did searches as long as there's been rangers, but it, um, it wasn't necessarily uh, formalized that rangers would be in charge, if you will, broadly for for searches. So you were on Doug Leg search as well. It was the second year, the, the first summer that I worked. Yeah, nineteen seventy one, I believe, was that year. Was it some maybe June, July? So t tell us a little bit about the Doug Lake search and also how that um, change, how our role changed for searches um, from that point on. I'm sorry, I went off screen. Uh, our role came <laughs> with, our role came by default. The actual organizational level of that, and again, I guess George and Gary are the only two that would that would. Uh, help my memory here, but that search specialty never had a given authority in the state agencies. George made a little bit of a reference to the state police uh, with the story about the plane wreck. Well, those kind of evidences were finally straightened out when 1980 Olympics hit and they said, we're gonna have the whole world here, we've gotta have somebody that is ultimately in charge of these kind of emergencies. <laughs> That's when it finally happened, legislatively. The search and rescue bill, and they were trying to get that through the legislature for a number of years. Finally, the Olympics here are straight. But it started out with the recognition of the Douglas Lake effort was not a failed effort as far as his organization, but coordination between all the different agencies that, that were responsible was part of what they, when they did a critique, when that's part of what they, they tried to figure out. Again, for I think everybody would know the Douglas Lake incident. Bottom line was a seven, eight, nine year old boy that we never, never found. And so out of that, incident in 71, eventually by 1980, there is now, in the era that, that the, the, the careers are just ending for, we're two careers behind, George and I, whatever, but, but the, the bottom line is we, uh, we ended up with coordination of searches. Doesn't mean we're the guy that looks over in the bushes and sees them. But somebody has to organize all the resources that gets the guy to be in the right place to look over in the bushes and see him. That was a key element that came out of the, the uh, Douglas Lake, that started with the Douglas Lake search. Gary, you must have some kind of in, input on, on that, because you were deep into it at that time. And Gary Lee was also on the original search and rescue team. <coughs> and these search and rescue teams did, they, they they fell apart, they went to the model, I mean, you can expand on this why they went away, but they, uh, they went to the model where the initial, the ranger for that area would be in charge of the search initially when the call came in. And I believe that, it kind of went to that after the search and rescue teams went away. And it wasn't part of it because um, you could be, if you're on that team, you could be anywhere in the state, next thing you know you had a search in your backyard. Wasn't that part of it for those to go away? Yes, yeah, so it did. There was a, there was a, uh, a test period, a shakedown period of that organization, and it ended up, and that's why there's a six months academy now to be a forest ranger. It ended up, and I think properly, that everybody that's on that roster of forest rangers 
should be able to do everything that might be specializing in, in uh, special skills geographically didn't work. It wasn't the nearest state's a big spot and you can roughly 100 people to cover all that. You just aren't going to have the right expertise on the scene. It might be three hours away before you get the right. So now the effort of the, of the academy program now is to have everybody at the workable level of training. And it came out of this history that this what, what uh, Scott's trying to point out is they, they, the younger generation, the middle generation, the younger generation is, is the ones who you refer to here, but the middle generation had, had the transition time that came from all of our research time. As our programs were research programs, is what it amounts to. Now the, the rescues in the high peaks, especially in the winter, you know, we, we would always refer to them as like expeditions. Like every time we went to the Johnsburg Valley in the winter, it, it was an expedition. And we had one in 2007 where, you know, Julie was the most important ranger on that incident. So there were like 20 to 25 rangers through the course of the 24 hours or so of that rescue. But Julie's the one who uh, saved the gentleman's life, and uh, I'd like her to tell that story now. Exaggerating, but um, <laughs> Julie's more modest than everybody else. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not as good a storyteller. But um, this this story is uh, I for me the one that uh, means the most to me. So 2007, uh, this gentleman and his buddy were hiking um, the high peaks, and they had gone in and they were staying at Peggio. So that's one of the little cabins there, and they had two younger boys with them, a son and then a friend and they were coming down Saddleback Mountain. And um, basically one of the gentlemen kind of, it's a real steep pitch, um, snowy, it's January, so he slides and he just tumbles and he gets down to the bottom and he hits his head on a rock and he's unresponsive at the bottom of the hill. So the other gentleman who is now at the top is um, basically like, oh my gosh, I gotta get to him. So he starts down the hill and he wipes out and he goes head over heels, and his snowshoe hit him in the forehead. So you can kind of picture that motion. And he was very, very busted up. Um, and uh, the first two people to him were the kids, but then also two New York City firefighters, which I attribute them to saving his life, because they kind of organized things and stayed with him, packaged him up to kind of keep him warm, because obviously he wasn't going anywhere without us getting him out of there. Um, so the kids had to run back down to Peggy O, put on a radio call. We had to get into them. I think it was two or three in the morning when the first, um, I call them gazelles. Those are the young people that can really move fast. <laughs> the first gazelles got to, got to this gentleman, and it wasn't me. I'm back there. But um, they got to him and kind of did a quick assessment, um, did a really nice job, realized it was probably a pelvis or probably a femur. Couldn't quite tell. We don't have x-rays. Um, and so they're like, okay, well, Stokes Basket is coming up behind us. Um, but when we got there, I realized that pelvic injuries are by far the most dangerous thing that you can encounter there. And um, if you move them wrong and, and they start bleeding into their pelvis, um, you, could, you could lose them on the way down. So we made the decision, right or wrong, but we made the decision to just kind of stay in place and wait for a helicopter the next morning. Um, which we were hoping for like first light ended up being more like nine or ten by the time the winds kind of died down um, but you know I've often said that you know people live in spite of us because I didn't really do anything for him besides keep him company and just talk to him and kind of get his mind off of that pain and I kind of remember that pretty vividly that I was with Peter and everyone else was as far away as they could get but still be in sight of us. And they were building fires all night long because that night it was negative 22 and negative 40 with the windshield. And uh, at that point, we didn't have the gear that we do now where we could go in and, and erect a tent over top of somebody to, to help protect them. And it was cold. It was super cold. And you so cold that you couldn't really do anything besides, you, know, you couldn't even take your hands out of your gloves to, to do anything. 
Um, and he was in excruciating pain, and I, you know, I didn't, I'm almost a paramedic now, but I didn't have narcotics in the field with me, and I was too cold to even give them because they would have frozen if I'd taken them out of the bag. But, um, so he was just in excruciating pain. So we talked all night long. He told me his life story, I told him my, his, my life story, and when we stopped talking, he started, you know, kind of screaming or groaning in pain. And uh, so we stopped talking again. So um, it was a very, very long night, but we became pretty good friends, and uh, he's one of the few people that have kind of kept in touch, and his, um, last year, I believe it was, his, uh, his fiance actually called me and said, hey, Tomorrow is the 14th anniversary of that rescue. Would you mind calling Peter? And so I did. So we had a chat, and we both were crying on the phone. And uh, so it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty special. And he is very fit, and now he's doing the 46 High Peaks with his 14-year-old son. That was a very, very happy story. Julie was great at, at training us in first aid, but you also got a, a, a sense of real confidence and calm when um, you were with her on one. And uh, excuse me, we, we had one um, one incident. You were already a lieutenant at this time, but an uh, ice climber fell on the north side of pitch off, and uh, Julie was pretty new to uh, being a lieutenant. So she, you know, sometimes people, sometimes rangers take these lieutenant jobs kind of reluctantly. Um, or maybe have regret, regrets that they take them, I'm not sure. I never, I was smart enough not to do that. Actually, you are the only one on the stage that actually became a supervisor. Me, me. So anyway, uh, Robert Jackal and I had the initial call and, you know, had the cell phone call. You could hear, um, the guy who called was his climbing partner. He fell 30 or 40 feet. Uh, but you could hear the other guy screaming, um, you know, through the phone. And, um, it was, he was at the base of the route, but it was a, it was a bit tricky to get up there. So I remember uh, Julie being at the end of the old mountain road as we're about to head in with Rob, and uh, Rob and I said to each other, what we need to do here is get Julie to him. <laughs> that is step one, you just need to get Julie to him. So we did, and I remember you were, because you were a lieutenant, you know, Lieutenants get these little tiny cars, and, and the field rangers get the big trucks with all the gear. And they, I remember you were missing something, crampons, or I think you didn't have crampons. You had given them to another ranger son. So I remember we kind of hauled you up to him. I had them, because I remember stabbing myself. Okay. <laughs> so our job was just to make sure we got Julie there, and we did. And that was another one who, um, you know, you really saved his life. But I remember being, um, you know, being like another set of hands for you. I don't I, I obviously didn't have your expertise, but you know, it's another set of hands and, and just made you calm to know that Julie was there to, to guide you, to guide your hands. You know? Yeah, that was that was a complicated one because he, he had a big fall and he had really tight like ice climbing gear on. And so when we started like finally getting a chance to do an assessment, we start cutting the gear, we realized he's bleeding from here and here and here. I mean he was he, I used every bit of first aid stuff in my backpack. And uh, on that rescue, and it's still really when we got him to the hospital and he thawed out, he, that he was still bleeding quite a bit. Um, but he he survived. He had a lot of serious injuries, but um, we ended up doing that was I think the first time we used a vacuum mattress uh, yeah, in right. the field, um, and then put him in a, a sked, and then dragged him, and then put him behind a snowmobile, and then dragged him, and finally got him to uh, to an ambulance. So. That time we did have pain medication, so he was well, well medicated. Not enough, but well medicated. So. I remember being worried crossing the pond with him in, in the litter, yeah. because I, because all of us, you know, all that weight on the pond. I remember having some fear about that giving way. You know, you know, you plan for these things, you train for these things, but there's so much unknown when you're out there that you got to improvise and, uh, you know, sometimes hope for the best for it. Um, another thing I remember, you know. It, um, from our time working together, um, this will segment into a, a story um, for a, another large incident for you. But you know, one of the things that you would deal with um, is, is homeless people on the state land and people that have mental illness. And, and uh, this wasn't on your notes when we, we oh, had sure, talk, talked it. All. <laughs> but uh, do you remember? <laughs> I remember you and I going down and, and just uh, meeting and talking. You know, because there's laws and regulations for how long you can camp on the state land, but you have to... Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is going to segment into the other one, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, you have to improvise and, and deal kindly with people because it, you know, you know, it does no good to just haul somebody off. You know, so. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, so I just remember you and I um, spending weeks and just, just trying to develop a rapport with someone who had an obvious mental illness. And I believe you contacted his family? Yeah, I did. Uh, he, he was schizophrenic, um, and he, uh, he was off his medication, so he was basically <coughs> living on state land with very, very, very little. Um, Scott would bring him, I think you brought him a tent or a sleeping bag. I did, I brought him all sorts of gear. I remember bringing him, like, it's not the best food, but I remember going to McDonald's and go through the drive thru and bring him food. And I can't remember who my supervisor was at the time, but I remember uh, getting yelled at for that. You're just going to make him stay. Yeah, we're trying to get him out of there. And Scott's bringing him stuff to help him stay. <laughs> Compassionate. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did contact his family once we finally got a name out of him. Um, and his family, and it's this is so sad, is that his family is like, we love him, we absolutely will take him back, but only if he stays on his meds. And so he'd come home, he'd get on his meds, he'd be fine for a while, he'd feel good, and he would stop taking his meds because he feels good, and then he would basically just, you know, regress back further and further. And I remember he finally was arrested for mental health when, um, he was, I think, down in Tucker Lake riding a bicycle, like flashing people uh, along the highway. And the trooper, this is something that I learned, is like very, you know, you always like, you want to like stay away from the word suicide, but the reality is, that's what he said. Have you ever thought about hurting yourself? And the guy said, yes. He goes, click, click. And he just arrested him and brought him to the hospital. But until that kind of interaction happens, but at this point, this guy was eating dirt. That's, you know, that's how bad he got before we kind of were able to really interject and, or intercede. Yeah, he was getting thin, because I remember we, we actually saw him later, he came back briefly, yeah. and I remember he had gained a bunch of weight, I remember thinking about how thin he was getting for time, which is why I was bringing him to McDonald's, actually, not that <laughs> So, let's, that fat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, let, let's, we, it's one of the things we have to deal with is people that come to state land, not necessarily to recreate, but um, for other reasons, for, for mental illness, mental health issues. And Julie had another epic one in, um, in 2008, and I'll let you tell that story. Okay. Um, so just on patrol and got word over the radio that uh, there was a, a possible suicidal subject down on the Corys Road, which is between here and Tucker Lake. And uh, so state police were already on their way trying to, trying to find this person. He had called the uh, suicide hotline. And that's what kind of initiated our response. And uh, we were able to find his vehicle on a, kind of the old snowmobile trail there. Um, we did a bit of a search there. And the, the numbers are growing and growing in terms of the people coming to help find this person. And long story short, it, he ended up being armed. He had a, a, caliber, a 50 caliber uh, muzzle loader with him. And his, he was threatening to shoot himself. Um, we ended up again spotting him with a helicopter as we're trying to, you know, trying to look everywhere. The helicopter spotted somebody along the river, so we sent somebody down to um, to one of the campsites there, and he had a canoe, and he was in the canoe. And as soon as we kind of got to him, he pushed off from shore. We're trying to encourage him to come to shore, talk to us, talk to us, and he he won't, he won't. But we have a caretaker that stays at Racket Falls, and his boat was right there. So as he floated past, and he wouldn't come in. Um, I jumped in the boat and started the boat up, and two troopers um, jumped in with me, um, George and Dusty. And uh, so we, we followed him down the river, and as soon as I got close, he's got the muzzle loader to his throat, and he's threatening to kill himself. So we, of course, back off, and we're trying to talk to him, and it's hard to do with the motor running and everything. And he finally pulls into this little bay, and we start initiating a conversation, and it's getting darker and darker, and it's getting later and later, and he won't, he won't put the gun down. And, uh, you know, he's, he was warned, you know, do not swing that gun towards us. Um, and uh, that was, that's always a concern when we have somebody that's suicidal, is that they'll, they'll try and, you know, accomplish suicide by cop. And that would have happened if he had, it had swung the gun in our direction. But he didn't, he was clearly intending to hurt himself. Um, and long story short, they, we finally convinced him to kind of paddle back upstream and go to the Axton Landing, 
which is where the boat launch is, and he got close, but there was a bunch of vehicles, a bunch of lights, oh, and it just spooked him. So we went to the opposite shore and just kind of grabbed hold of the shore, and uh, I couldn't really keep the boat in motion trying to trying to sit there, so I grabbed his boat, shut the motor off, so now he's holding both of our boats. And we're talking more and more, we're trying to convince him, you know, it's right over there, we just paddle right over there, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you. And he's, he's just stalling and stalling and stalling and stalling and stalling. And, um, and one of the troopers kind of, uh, just kind of like, he drops his radio and he drops a couple things and he takes his ass baton out and he, he goes to, um, he's, he swipes at the guy's arm to hit his arm so that we can grab the gun. And in the struggle of trying to get the gun away from him, um, the gun is like, he's swinging the gun and the gun is coming towards my head and I literally just reached up and kind of caught it here. And the trooper saw the same thing and at the same time reached for the gun as well and was at the top of the gun when the gun went off. So he lost a good share of his first finger and his thumb um, to that incident and went out on disability, but uh, we ended up, you know, now the boat is floating free and George, George is in my boat and Dusty saw what was happening, tackled the guy, fell in the water with him and he's struggling with him, but now it's a muzzle over, so we know that there's not another shot, um, which was good, but um, you know, I brought George over to shore and then grabbed a couple more troopers, or actually a couple more people, I think the captain was with us, and uh, came back and, and then secured him to bring him back over. But uh, um, that was probably by far one of the things that you don't expect to have to deal with as a, as a New York State Forest. But I'm kidding. And that trooper that lost part of his hand was uh, George Standard. He, he actually did come back for a time. He uh, learned to shoot with the other hand. Yeah, it was pretty remarkable. But then he did have complications and didn't. Yeah, the cold. Was yeah, he didn't. He didn't stay. It just didn't work out for real long. Uh, George, you had you know being near Glens Falls, and also you know during the seventies and there were higher rates of crime then. You actually had quite a bit of law enforcement that you um, had to deal with down there. Is there one particular story that you want to share? Kind of transitioning a little from search to the law enforcement aspect. Well, originally, I always saw the ranger's job as, as being in the forest, helping people, explaining things, looking for the search, putting out the fires. And when they came time to give us the guns, myself and several others were against it. We did not want to portray the ranger as a cop. All due respect to the cops. God bless them. But they changed the nature of the job from being one of them, basically forestry and conservation, assisting people, educating people about the wilderness, to, be, to becoming police officers. They want us, well they did, you're wearing Sam Brown belts, you got mace, handcuffs, a flashlight, and a gun, and I perspired very heavy on the job. And a lot of people would ask me, George, are you all right? Are you all right? Yeah, it's just the nature of the beach, you know? So when it came out with the guns, and you had to wear that, it, it changed the image of the force stranger into being a police officer. And, I, and carrying all that gear on you, and my area, uh, Southern Warren and Northern Central County, was very fire per, uh, prof prof proficient putting out the fires. But they want us to wear that gun. When I go on a fire, what do I do with all that gear? I got a backpack pump or two on my back and in my hands, and I'm carrying all this. Work. It changed the nature of the job. And like I said, a lot of us were against it. I had a lock on the back of my truck. I had a toolbox you lock up. Inside the toolbox, I had an ammo box bolted to the bottom with a lock on it. And whenever I went to the Wordsbury office, I take the gun all, all on, but I put it in that box until I get to the Wordsburg office, then I would put the gun on and make it <laughs> to satisfy those people. But, but they got us involved as police officers that changed the nature of the job. And I, I didn't come on to be a, a 
law enforcement officer, I came out to be a poor stranger. And my nature has always been that, to help others <coughs> and uh, to do what I can. But uh, I, my year was all the fire the way I perspired. <laughs> and I did come upon a guy came up to me on a fire behind Queensbury School, when the old aviation airstrip there, we had a grass fire. And a guy came up to me and said, George, look at this pistol I found. Jeez, what am I going to do with that? Then all of a sudden, a guy came up and says, George, that's mine. And, and now I'm carrying a weapon out on a fire. I'm carrying one or two Indian tanks with dragging holes. And now I'm supposed to wear all that gear. And they never made exceptions for that. And I just took away from the nature of the job. And I feel bad for the, the new Rangers today. You know? And, and uh, we got the cell phone now, and you can talk to China. <laughs> and then now back here, I see we almost built 11 DC batteries. That's what we had. And we had to change the batteries. And then we had the issue with the fire towers. And I can remember when there was a big issue to get rid of the fire towers because they're obstructive to the view of the environment. And at the same time, they're talking about taking down the fire towers. Building the ski jump. Here in the <laughs> Very same time. I mean, guys like me, that's what we came on. But to condemn the fire towers because they expect the, the, the skyline. And they didn't only look for fires, but they were our, our dispatchers. Like they said, it, and they were our dispatchers, they were our eyes, our ears, our, they were our communications. And we did a lot for them. And then they started phasing them, and they went to the airplanes. And I got a call, half of us would work on a, on a Sunday, the weekend, it, it came to that point, and then it went from air, uh, the fire tower to air detection, and I was on a Sunday, and we got a call for a fire on Lake George, and I said to the pilot, what side of Lake George is on? And he couldn't tell me. He was going by his chart, his navigation. I said, and I'm in Queensbury, and it makes a big difference. I'm in the Southern and Lake George. And I go to the east side and to the west side. There's only half of us working. And this one came out. Well, he started describing these other ponds that he was seeing. It's on the east side, Lake George, up towards Whitehall and Dresden. That's where it was. Uh, but uh, the law enforcement part, I. You're not cops. You know. well, with, that, with the fire story you're starting to tell and finding the gun, I was expecting you to say it was yours. <laughs> but uh, let me ask Bill uh, along a similar line. So just for the audience, and Bill, if you want to talk about this one too, is uh, it was it Robert Garrow was a, a serial killer that uh, terrorized the Adirondacks. I don't know, was any, anybody here living in the Adirondacks at that time? Yeah, so, so, so there's still some memory. Um, you know, that, uh, you were on that one to some degree, right? Yeah. Um, why don't you tell us about, about that and then uh, how that played a role into Rangers getting guns and more law enforcement. So if you want to tell us about Garrow. Again, I got it. Remember what I told Scott just yesterday. <laughs> you can make up something new today. Yeah, well, or I'll make something up. Right. Uh, the, the theory of the law enforcement transition, I want to start out with this because it's very important, was the transition of the public. We're in a public service business. And when George and I started, and the Rangers that I referred to that came out of World War II, when they, their era, they were dealing with people that, they used to tell us, your job, if anyone asks you, your job is uh, care, custody, and control of the woodlands of New York and any emergencies that people have in those woodlands. That's what brought us in. That was the basis. So let me interject right here. When we came out, I came on the range in 68. Did you ever hear of the word stipulation? That, in 68, a couple years after that, the rangers had the power to a stipulation. If you found somebody breaking the law, you could find them 10, 50, 30 dollars. You took actual cash 
<laughs> on that person, and you gave that person a receipt. <laughs> that was fact. That was back in the 60s, it is, 70s. It is true. It wasn't constitutional, but it was true. <laughs> but, but that's what the Rangers would do back then, with a, a stipulation. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is true. It's really hard to believe. But it's true. They gave me the first day I come on the job. They gave me that stipulation book, and a guy didn't give it to me. Uh, Ed Carpenter, he says, uh, "You'll see that the ranger ahead of you never used this book. <laughs> there's no pages missing." He says. You need to turn it in when you retire the same way. <laughs> in the back there, there's two books. The Forest Ranger had a job, book one, book two. And in there, there's an article about a forest ranger who found someone who had cut down a, a, a tree. It was Christmas time. He cut down a tree to bring it to his house for the, his family. And this ranger followed the tracks from the tree to the guy's house. Did you, anybody see that article in that book? Somebody back there? George's scrapbook. Uh, kept, he kept an incredible scrapbook. Two of them. And it's, it's out there for people to look at. Well, anyway, to a stipulation, he took the $10 from that guy. It's Christmas time. And he gave him the receipt. And when he's going to the door, the guy had a pup, uh, a dog with, I think it was 10 puppies, 10 puppies, and then, so be it, he run, uh, the ranger runs into that guy, you know, a few days later in town, he says, by the way, all of a sudden I had an influx of people who came to my house and were paying $10 a piece for those puppies, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's in that book, but, <laughs> I think this whole thing is, is a, for, for you folks that, that haven't got the full history lesson here yet, it, it, it shows the difference between whoever got the job in 1950 and the difference in the job today. You're seeing it going right across here in the store. We're only two sections of it, but there's a third sitting here, and there's probably four or five that made that whole transition. So the public service you're getting now is a result of all that transition. One other objection, Bill. <laughs> well, here's your microphone. Mario Como, <laughs> he wanted to cut the force between the force in half, like 50 percent. 50 percent he wanted to eliminate of the force readers. But the outcry from the public and from all these well-known uh, editors and already papers their papers and people who were socially unfortunate, they came out and said, no, we need these rangers. So at one time there was a movement that cut 50 percent. I think back then it was about 150 rangers. I think it was quite and they wanted, that they, they wanted to save money on gas, and they put a quotas on the traveling you know, with our trucks. Well, that's not the story. <laughs> I don't even remember why I was telling when you started. <laughs> it was Carol. Carol. Oh yeah, Gero. The Gero era does fit in with this transition part about that we've gone from woodland management to crime management. In the Gero story, and Gero for background for anyone else that hasn't had it, was a, a, a known suspected murderer, and, and uh, in one case, and turned out being two. But the bottom line is the search that came out of that was appropriately, at the time, coordinated by state police uh, and other police agencies. Forest Rangers were just state employees before the gun era. Phone call on a, about 10, 11 o'clock at night during the Gero search. Bill, uh, we're going to have four people, and we'd like you to be one of them. Go. And they found three places where they think Gero spent the night, little wiki ups and such. And uh, David Ames, Mike Hagedorn, Howard Lashway, and myself got that phone call. 
We were assigned to the end. They asked, did you bring your rifle? And we're going to put you tomorrow in an assignment that is, basically it was an ambush set up. Sat there and watch these wiki ups that they think the hero has been using. Hero search durations a number of days, so they had, this was well into the search. We did all that. Eventually, the hero was, was shot to be captured, but not by that technique. He, he jumped the ship and took it, stole the car, and got out of the area. We were sitting there doing our 48 hours worth of assignment and probably 30, 40 hours through it is when he got out of the country, so we, we came back. Out of all of that stage from going from woodland managers into police work, there was quite a, after critique, quite a discussion about, you called up these forest rangers, told them to bring their rifle and be part of a shooting team, and they don't have anything but a state employee status. That evolved into, well, let's issue firearms to forest rangers, which they did. Still only state employees, no authority. They started teaching forest rangers the law work. Some of them learned enough to find out what they were doing was against the law. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot, of, all this is this transition from one to another. Eventually, after a, a few more years of legislative, just like it was for the search authority, eventually, forest rangers ended up with police authority, with peace officer status. And that's when George and I retired. A little bit after that come police officer status. And then, as you see in here today, you're seeing the transition to what this in, in this era is. I think that I didn't realize the value of this to, to make people realize the transition of what, how we got to where we are today. Interruption, Bill. When the state of New York issued us pistols, the state of New York put their pistol registration on, on my personal gun. <laughs> that's, that's how it was. Those of us who had personal gun permits, the state of New York put their weapon on our personal permit. And you, and you didn't like that? All right, how about we, uh, we finish up with some questions from the audience? We must have some questions. I know it happens more today than probably back in your time, but you told a very emotional story. You had a very emotional incident, and I'm sure you all did multiple times. How do you deal with that to lead that? Obviously, you're compassionate people. How do you deal with that ongoing to you know, have a rescue where somebody like that young man that you saved? There's, how do you deal with that mentally, yourself carrying on through life? Yes, you do. Yeah, but how do you do it? Yeah, uh, you know, there I mean, you get trained. I'm sure the younger people now, like, there's debriefing and so forth after a rescue. <laughs> uh, uh, no, sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know the volunteer firemen and things like that. Yeah. But, I mean, how do you do that? How do you go through? I know it takes a special <clears throat> person to do well, that. A lot, of, a lot of times it's just rangers having discussions among ourselves. So peer support. There, there is some, you know, some incidents they will call in a debriefing team like the fire departments have and stuff and, and um, right. in certain instances. But most of the time it's, you know, the people that were on that incident after the incident getting together, you know, people calling each other and saying, hey, Scott, how you doing? You know, if you want to talk about it, let's, let's you know, and, and really just mental health days, like the best part of my job is that I can walk out in the woods and see no one. And sometimes that's the best mental health that, uh, that, that you can have, is just being able to enjoy the woods yourself. So. There was a, you know, at least maybe only one time, but there was a stress management class, remember that? <laughs> there was a lot going on. It was during the controversies over land management and the APA hit and all that. And the Rangers took quite a little bit of that because they were state employees standing there in uniform. 
And there was a stress management course that was sponsored in Warrensburg, at least, for anyone who didn't have to go to it. And anyone who thought they might and, uh, benefit went to it. And when they got done, they did just exactly what Scott just did. They says, is there any questions? And I described the situation. I says, and how should that be handled? And they says, uh, is there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> in my situation, I had five fire departments, three rescue squads. And whatever the issue was, once we found that person, the personnel of those fire departments and rescue squads were top notch. And going through the procedure that they're trained to do, less than the burden. I left it in very capable hands, and now I had no problem. I did my job, we found them, turned it over to those people, and they took care of the rest of it. So I, I was very fortunate. I very would, good people. I would second that, what George just said, because I felt, and we felt, once we got that guy bent, broken, whatever condition he was into, down to the road, down the, out to the next level of, of, of emergency response, we could go, your question, we could go home <coughs> knowing that we did everything we could up in the bushes in the dark and when it was eight below and the wind blowing. But the ultimate, and if he was still breathing when he went in the back of that ambulance, that was kind of a dividing line right there. Thank you. Other questions? Really? No. Hey guys. Uh, go ahead. Um, I'm Madeline, thank you, this has been awesome. I uh, appreciate everyone's inputs. I have a question about ECO. Um, that, I think ECOs were started sometime in the 80s, right? They, they actually predated the forest rangers. But oh, did they? Yeah, okay. the environmental conservation officer, so originally they were game protectors. Okay. Um, and, then... and they predated uh, the forest rangers title. They were a law enforcement agency, agency really from the very beginning. Their job dramatically shifted in the 60s with uh, environmental law. Yeah, and, so I'm wondering like... numbers really increased. Right, so that's, that's like what I'm referring to. During that transition time, what was it like? Like, I know there's been some, like mention um, about governmental, like, you know, government inflictions on uh, ranger work. And I know that there's been some things happening with ECOs as far as wanting to um, sort of infringe on ranger work. Um, I'm curious about what it was like for you two gentlemen during that time period when ECOs were given more um, like take on the area. I, I'd like to answer that question. Did you ever hear of the Adirondack sign law? No. <laughs> People live here the Adirondacks and you... The sign law? It's not enforced anymore. The Adirondack sign law. Sign law. Sign, sign law. law. Yeah, okay, okay, yes. If you're going to advertise your business, yeah, yeah. Certain size, certain size of the signs, certain colors, locations, forest rangers were given a job to enforce that law, and conservation officers, to my knowledge, never got involved in enforcing the Adirondack sign law. They were in the cars, air conditioned, and we were trucks <laughs> with fire equipment on, and we were looking at signs for businesses. <laughs> my first kid, Say it. My first came on my first year on Route 149, Queensbury Golf Course. There's four huge maple trees, three, four feet in diameter. And the Adirondack Park line cut through those trees. And there was a sign on one tree advertising this golf course. And it was a neat little sign. It was inside the Adirondack Park. It didn't fit the location, the size, or any of that. I knock on the door to the country club guy comes out. I said, who he was. He explained to me. I said, uh, that sign's uh, in violation. It's got to be moved. He says to me, who are you? How long have you been here? I says, my name's George Steck. I was born and raised in Poughkeepsie. And this is my first year on a job. He says to me, how would you like to be transferred to Buffalo? <laughs> I looked him in the eye and said, I'm not going to Buffalo. In the meantime, so I reported to a uh, George Stewart district ranger and, and uh, Russ Mulvey. They came down and the three of us got that guy up by the sign. 
And they said to him, you do what the ranger tells you, remove the sign. And all he had to do was take that sign off of one tree, go over 50 feet, put it on the other tree, it would be legal. <laughs> but that, and the CEOs, they didn't, poor Jim White and Bone Randy, all those businesses up and down that Bone Road on the west side of Lake George, he had to go and inventory all those signs, see which ones were legal, which ones were, that's not the forest ranger's job. That's the conservation order's job. There are two pay grades ahead of us. What was happening? <laughs> Bill, you must want to say something. <laughs> I think best is I shouldn't comment. <laughs> but uh, I, would, I, but I, would. I know that it's part of what I kept referring to of the change of what, I mean, somebody just said they don't enforce the law anymore. Well, the sign law still exists. It's just yeah. not the problem that it was. In your guys' area, it was a big deal. I think it's part it's of the package of, of the transition in, into where we are now. <coughs> and I'm not at all surprised to see that the Arundel sign law isn't enforced because it's, it's, uh, it's a long ways from the Adirondacks to the Supreme Court, but I'm sure that's where it would get settled. <laughs> see, the, the, stip the stipulations, the sign law, the guns, these are all things that transpired over the years, you know, and I think we had the good old days. <laughs> I mean, every agency that has tasked with some kind of enforcement will have, like, turf wars with others. And uh, the Rangers of their era, like, had a lot of turf wars with the state police at that time, mostly based on search. And that had to do with this, um, listen, search is just, it's just that operation that, Everybody wants because you always look good. If you do it well, right? If you're good at it, you look good. You don't always look good doing enforcement. Yes, we want law enforcement, but um, it, we always had the white hat. You know, when we did search and rescue, we always had the white hat. So there were some conflicts at time. I know last year that that got that um, got talked about more. I'll I'll just say this that the. The ECOs and the Ranger positions are not nearly as similar as people think they are. They, they wear the green uniforms and they both work for what's the DEC today, but they're just not as similar as people think they are. They, they have very distinct differences, uh, and the biggest one is culture. <laughs> Every agency gets its own culture, and you can tell, actually this is a pretty good example of where our culture came from. And um, they're they're just very they're very different, but yeah, there would be some kind sometimes uh, you know issues in, in uh, turf wars in that way. Julie and I uh, and Tom and Scott Murphy, we were in the first joint academy, and there was this idea by like someone had that you know that they should be more alike or at least we'll save money in training, and it probably made some sense if I um, my father's a ranger, so I knew it was a bad idea. <laughs> but, but I mean, if you were looking at it from a different perspective, I could see the rationale. But I have to say that it was a disaster. It, it, it didn't work, and it took 25 years for people to realize it didn't work. Um, for a lot of reasons we won't go into, but it just, it, it was a failure. And that Rangers, um, instead of bringing us closer to get along better, it actually caused us to fight more and uh, have more of what your, 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 your question alluded to. So, for the new Rangers, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it ended, it ended. And I, I think it's really good for the conservation officers and the Rangers that they uh, have separate academies. Um, I got time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure in a long career there's been a lot of humorous incidents that have happened in the different generations. I remember last year you commenting on a couple and like the, the women that were burning their clothing as a porch to get out of the woods. So what are some of the things that happened with you folks? Just quickly to kind of finish off here maybe. Yeah, let's start on that end. You guys start. Humor situation I can recall. I think dealing with the public in general. <laughs> some of the stuff that they come up with What we test to this? I lived in the log house. I, I lived in the log house for 15 years. It was a dirt road when we moved there. 
and the state came down and said we're going to have a, a sign on our property indicating Forest Ranger headquarters. Because when we signed the contract, the contract said you will receive the public in your home. That was in writing. So then they come up with a sign, put the post on down, Forest Ranger headquarters. My private residence. My wife comes home and hears four ladies at the bottom of the driveway with a card table having lunch. Thinking that this is a state facility. We, we've had scout leaders bring scouts up to our house on their own to look at the view because this is a state house. We've had women's snowmobilers come up to the house and want to use the bathroom. <laughs> you know, this is human, but where we live, with the location, we got the eyes to the people, the car table, the scouts. One woman came with two kids, and I was coming out of my unit. Here he is. This is a real force stranger. You know, but that, that's the humor. It was, most of it was around the headquarters, you know, on the job down the field. Every day was a humorous day because laugh and the world lives with you crying to cry alone. <laughs> well, most humorous part of my job was George. <laughs> Because of what George just described, the public perceived that, that once somebody came to the door, even if it wasn't a forest ranger, it was a state employee. Somebody did come to our door, this is a story about my wife. Somebody came to the door, says, have Bill call off the search, I found my way out. She says, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I'm sorry, but there ain't no search. And when I got home at, at night, at, at the end of the day, she tells me that story. And it goes that this guy knew me, or knew the system, and knew where I lived. But the, the assumption was that there would be one of these massive, on his part, would be one of these massive searches for him. <laughs> Not even his wife called up and called <laughs> up. It's not going very funny to him, but I thought it was quite entertaining. When they say, when the, when the state of New York hired a forest ranger who was married, they got two for the price of one. <laughs> that was a deal. Because when we're away from home, the phone rings, she answers the phone. Takes the message, people come knocking on the door, I want to speak to the forest stranger. He's not here. He's not here. What do you mean he's not here? His truck's out there, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's his truck. Well, another ranger picked him up to go somewhere for training or something. But they insist. And the wife's taking all this in. <laughs> they got two for the price of one, and that's the one of the best deals. Of course, I got the best deal once on one. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, our last thing we want, do we have one more question? No? We're good? Okay, you can, all right, last one, last one. Okay, thank you for everything you do. Uh, I think we all appreciate it very much. And it was great uh, seeing faces connected to the articles I've read in the newspaper over the years. But a comical story was that I had a young colleague that worked with me at Star Lake, and she decided that she was going to invite her uh, college friends to go and cram uh, to uh, camp on an island in Cranberry Lake. But she didn't have permission to do that, so she went to the island. They put up their tents and that sort of thing. Uh, the forest ranger came along and said to them, uh, "What are you doing here?" And she said, "Oh, we're camping." And and uh, he said, really? And who told you you could do that? And it was Bernie Siskavich, and I don't know if you know him or not. Of course, of course. Uh, so anyways, uh, Bernie said, uh, <coughs> my colleague said to Bernie, well, Bernie Siskavich, she knew who it was, the forest stranger, but she didn't know that who he was. So she said, uh, Bernie Siskavich told us we could do this. And he said, oh, he, he did? And she said, yes, and it's perfectly okay. 
And so then the conversation went on, and she kept saying about Bernie Siskiewicz. So finally, he said, uh, excuse me, but do you know that I'm Bernie Siskiewicz? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to say that when you come across somebody who's camped illegally, in particular, has a little issue, the most common thing you get is, well, so-and-so, the ranger said this was okay. I saw a ranger earlier that said this was okay. We get that all the time when you ask to describe the ranger. So thanks all for coming. I, uh, to close out, today is George Steck's 85th birthday. Oh. <laughs> and George, we made a cake for you, or <laughs> it wasn't me. It was actually made by one of Holly Bowser's company up in Malone. But uh, can you see that? Or can get up, take a look. But it, we can do all sorts of pictures. But um, we put a ranger patch on it. It's tr the traditional ranger patch. It's not the new one. And it says, Happy birthday, old ranger. Thank you. Come take George. I did.